Good evening, everyone. On behalf of New Canaan Library, um, I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services. I'd like to thank you for joining tonight's Yale Science Communications Program. Tonight, they will discuss the origins of living things on our planet. I'd also like to extend my thanks to them for conducting this program. Um, I'd like to ask that you use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions um, for tonight's presenters. And now I will turn the virtual floor over to Olivia. Great, thank you so much. Great, so uh, as you've heard, I'm Olivia, and I'm so excited to be introdu introducing our talk today uh, on how to build an earth, just add water. We're from Science in the News with Yale Science Communication, an organization of graduate students at Yale committed to engaging and informative science outreach. You'll be hearing from three speakers today about the origins of life on earth and what makes it unique. So each speaker will have 15 minutes and then we will have time for questions at the end. So first, you're going to hear from Garrett, who studies planetary system formation in the astronomy department. He's also a huge baseball fan in his spare time and has visited 23 of the MLB stadiums. Next, you'll hear from Victor, who studies neurodegenerative genetic diseases and is from the garlic capital of the world. And then finally, we have Dan, who models the behavior of water molecules in the molecular biophysics and biochemistry department. And like many of us this year, he's been doing a lot of baking and has a sourdough starter named Evangeline. So before I hand things off to our first speaker, I wanna give you a brief overview of our topic today. So the goal of our presentation is to give you a deep dive into how our planet became the earth, this bright blue marble that you can see in the background here. Um, and we sometimes take the existence of Earth for granted, but the fact that the Earth was able to create life and sustain all of us is so unique that we don't know of another time that it happened. So first, Garrett is going to take us back to the very first formation of the Earth and show us how uh, water came to Earth for the first time. Next, Victor is going to bring us forward a little to the primordial earth and tell us about the importance of water for creating the very first building blocks that would later become life. And then finally, Dan is going to tell us about the unique properties of the molecules that make up life on earth today and tell us about some still unsolved mysteries of these asymmetric molecules. So with that, I will turn things over to Garrett to start us off. Awesome, thank you for the introduction, Olivia. Um, can everybody see my slides now? And if I go full screen, everyone can hopefully still see my slides. Uh, awesome. So as Olivia said, my name is Garrett Levine and I'm a grad student here at Yale studying planetary formation and evolution. So I study physics and how we can understand planet formation and how they evolve over time through those laws of physics. And today I want to talk about how the earth got its water. So we're talking about life and we want to talk about water first. So why should we do that? Well, I like to start by uh, looking at this image on the right side of the slide, the earth rise taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts. In the front, we see the gray, dead, lifeless moon, but in the background, we see this active dynamic blue marble, the living earth. And in fact, all life as we know it on earth requires water. And so clearly water is very important. Everywhere we find water on earth, we find life as well. Now to give you a sense for how much water we're talking about, I'm showing an image on the left side of the slide where it's almost as if I took all of the water in the earth's oceans and bundled it up into a ball and put it next to the dried out earth. As you can see, there's really not that much water that we're talking about, but it's very important for life. So we should figure out where it came from. Now there's two options for how Earth could have gotten its water. First, the Earth could have been born with its water. Whatever stuff the Earth formed from would have had that sphere of water in it, and that's how it ended up here. Alternatively, if that didn't happen, the Earth has to have acquired its water later. So we'll use the principles of physics and astronomy to figure out which is the case. Like all good science, we should start by looking around us and making observations of the universe. So I have a cartoon diagram of the solar system on the top of the slide, but what I really want you to look at is this bird's eye view of the solar system. This is essentially what you would see if you took a spaceship and flew above the solar system and looked down on it. 
Now, there doesn't look like there's much going on here, but we can make a few key observations that will lead us to some insight. First, similar planets are grouped together. So we have the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all orbiting very close to the sun. Moving a little bit further out, we have Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants. These are both a few hundred times the size of Earth, and they're made up of mostly hydrogen and helium gas. Moving further out, we have the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, which are made up of hydrogen and helium gas, but also have lots of methane ice and water ice in them as well. Second, the solar system is about as flat as a pancake. So it's not razor thin and it's not like a sphere either, but this flatness is telling us something. And combined with the fact that the planets orbit in the same direction, we can start to think about a common origin for the planets. Perhaps they all form together and this is why we see these patterns in the, in the solar system. Now I'm gonna tell you a story, a story come up by fit with, that physicists came up with around the year 1800, and they used it to explain planet formation. Uh, later, we'll get a little bit of insight as to how they could have come up with this theory, but first I just want to put these ideas in your head. So let's imagine that we have a cloud of gas and dust in space and there happens to be so much matter that the cloud can't support itself under its own weight. It buckles under the force of self-gravity and it starts to contract. Now, what happens when something like this contracts, when it shrinks? Well, the gas and dust should actually start to spin faster and it should flatten into a disk. Now at the center of this disk, we should form the star. That's where the most stuff is and this star will be our sun. Later on in this gas and dust disk, the dust will stick together to form pebbles, which then stick together to form boulders, which then eventually stick together to form planets. And now we have a solar system. And we think that this takes place on the time scale of a few million years. So you might be wondering, how would someone have come up with this hypothesis? And what we're actually gonna do is make a few analogies to everyday life to give us some insight into the physics of spinning and shrinking clouds, these clouds that buckle under their own weight. So a cloud of gravitating gas will spin. We can connect this to the physics of everyday life through ice skating. Notice when our ice skater wants to jump and spin fast, she pulls her hands outwards and she pulls them in towards her body. By pulling her arms towards her body, she allows herself to spin faster just like what is happening in our cloud when things move from out to in. The cloud shrinks, things move in, and the cloud starts to spin more quickly. Now what happens when something starts to spin quickly? It should flatten. And we can understand this using the physics of fair rides, using our intuition of what's going on here. So when the swinging chair ride starts out, all of the chairs are hanging straight down. They're hanging uh, perpendicular to the ground. Now when the ride starts to go, it starts to spin and we see the chairs rise. Now we can imagine if this ride got completely out of control, the chairs would continue to flatten until they formed a disc. Now when things, when something so big in outer space is collapsing under its own weight and spinning more quickly, you can imagine that things might start to flatten into the disc-like shapes we're hypothesizing. So the key point here is that we can use the physics of everyday life to figure out that gravitating gas and dust, this cloud that buckles under its own weight, forms a protoplanetary disk. Proto meaning before and planets meaning planets. So this is the before planets disk. Now in the 200 years since we've come up with these uh, theories of physics and planet formation, we've had major advances in computational power. Our computers are much better, or our computers actually exist. So what we can do is we can simulate what's going on here. We can tell the computer, we can set up this cloud of gas and dust, and we can tell the computer that gravity exists, and we can see what happens. So as we see here on the left side of the slide, this animation is the beginning parts of the simulation. This is just the beginning of cloud collapse. Now, if I fast forward around 250,000 years and zoom in about 15 times, I can get a more granular sense of what's going on. So we see that a disc-like structure actually starts to form in the bottom right of this second panel. Now that's really amazing. This is pretty much what we predicted from 
theories of physics relating to ice skating and fair rides. And what's even more remarkable is that the computer doesn't know about these ice skaters and it doesn't know about fair rides. The only thing we tell it is that the gas and dust exists and that gravity exists, yet we're able to find the same behavior that we expect intuitively. Now, this is really, really cool. And this to me is what physics is about. Now, it's great that we have this theory of physics and we have the simulations to back it up, but what we really want to do is look out into outer space and see this process happening around other stars. On the left side of the slide here, I've shown the Milky Way that you might see if you get a great view of the night sky. You can see the background stars, the bright bulge in the top left of the slide, but in front of that, you can see these dark clouds, these dark patches that are blocking all of the starlight from getting to you. Now, the scientists that came up with the nebular hypothesis, this protoplanetary disk mechanism, correctly hypothesized that these clouds are the clouds of gas and dust that are actively forming stars today. And with better telescopes, we've been able to zoom in on one of these clouds. This is the second uh, corresponding to roughly that second animation that we saw on the last page. We can see this dark cloud, but we can't really see what's going on inside. But what we do know is that there's gas and dust there, and it's blocking all of the starlight from the background stars behind it. Now, this is pretty good evidence that these clouds exist, but what would be, what would be really awesome is if we saw the disks themselves. So it's obviously really hard to see inside these black clouds. They obscure all of the light. All of the light is blocked. But what we've been able to do over the last five years is develop telescopes that can image just the dust themselves. And what we see is really remarkable. We see essentially what we predicted. We see this disk of gas inside these dark clouds. And what we see is the, in the bright spots is where the dust is. But what's actually the craziest thing about this image is that we see dark rings in the disk. Now, this is where the dust isn't. And we could hypothesize that this is where the dust is sticking together to form pebbles and where the pebbles are sticking together to form boulders. And those boulders are sticking together to form planets. And with even better telescopes, just in the last couple of years, we've been able to get an even better look at these disks. And what do we see? We see a blob of light floating around in one of these gaps, these dark patches in the disk. Now, this is indisputably a planet. This is the slam dunk evidence for the nebular hypothesis. This is saying that planets form in the disks and they form where the dust sticks together. So to me, this is amazing. This is taking 200 years of physics. This is taking computer simulations and putting it all in one image. And this is proving our theories correct. So we've taken a little bit of a detour in terms of water. But we now know how the Earth formed, and we now want to characterize the environment. We want to figure out if water could have existed in the environment that formed the Earth. So we've been looking at a bird's eye view of the disk so far. This is basically like looking at a pancake from above. But we want to take an edge-on view of the disk now. We want to slice that disk and almost look at the stack of pancakes from the side, or one pancake from the side. To figure out if water can exist in this disk, we need to look at the temperature structure. We need to figure out where it's hot and where it's cold in the disk. Now, if I'm closer to the sun, it's warmer. And if I'm further away from the sun, it's colder. And at some point in this disk, there's what is called the ice line. Now, if I'm on the warm side of the ice line, the, the side that's close to the sun, water exists as a gas, water is a vapor. And if I exist on the far side of the ice line, water is solid and it can be incorporated into the planets that are forming. It's ice. Now, you might be wondering where the liquid water is, but in outer space, water actually behaves like dry ice. It goes straight from a vapor, from a gas to a solid to ice and vice versa. There is no liquid phase unless I have an atmosphere. So I need an atmosphere actually to have liquid water. Now, we can kind of figure out where the ice line is just observationally. When I'm closer to the sun, I see objects like Mercury. There's no water on Mercury. All I see is barren rock. 
Now, if I move further out, I see objects like Saturn's moon Enceladus. Enceladus, as we can see, is completely covered by water ice. So clearly, Enceladus formed outside of the ice line. Now, if I do a theoretical calculation of the temperature, I can actually figure out that Earth is in a location where it was too warm for water to exist as ice. So water could actually not have been in the stuff forming Earth. Earth formed too hot to have water. So Earth has to have gotten its water from somewhere else. Obviously, we would like to figure out where that somewhere else is. And for that, we'll actually have to look at the water molecule itself. So water is H2O, which is made up of two hydrogens and one oxygen. But what you might not know is that hydrogen comes in two main forms. It comes in regular hydrogen and heavy hydrogen. We'll call them for now. Now, what I can do is I can use the amount of heavy and regular hydrogen in water as a chemical fingerprint of sorts. If I compare the amount of regular and heavy hydrogen in Earth's water, and I can match that up to something else in the solar system, then I probably have a pretty good idea of where Earth's water came from. So the key point is that heavy versus regular hydrogen is a chemical fingerprint. If I can match Earth's heavy hydrogen to somewhere else in the solar system, then I might have a match for where Earth's water came from. And scientists have been doing this over the past few decades. And on this slide, I'm gonna plot the planets. Uh, and the higher up they are on the slide, the more heavy hydrogen they have. So the sun and the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have around the same heavy hydrogen content. This makes sense because they formed from the same cloud of gas and dust. So this is another check mark for the nebular hypothesis. The sun also has around the same heavy hydrogen content as other stars. This is also pretty good because this means that whatever formed the sun probably had the same process probably formed the other stars as well. Now, comets have too much heavy hydrogen compared to Earth, but Earth has almost exactly the same proportion of heavy hydrogen as asteroids. So now I can come up with an idea of where Earth's water came from. We can say that Earth has to have formed too hot to, to have water, but Earth eventually formed, got an atmosphere, and then asteroids collided with Earth. And when they collided with Earth, they brought their water with them and left it on the Earth for us. And that's how the Earth got its uh, liquid water. So the key point here is that bombardment by asteroids after most of the Earth formed probably delivered the water to Earth. And we know this through light and heavy hydrogen. So where are we? Um, first, we talked about the nebular hypothesis, which is where this cloud of gas and dust uh, buckles under its own weight forms a disk, and in that disk, dust sticks together to form pebbles, which form boulders, which form planets. Then what we did is we looked inside the disk itself, and we figured out that where Earth formed, it was too hot to have water in the stuff that formed Earth. So Earth has to have gotten its water from somewhere else. And then finally, we looked at where that water could have come from. And by comparing the light and heavy hydrogen ratios, we figured out that water came from asteroids. So where are we in our checklist of building an Earth? Now, uh, I've shown you how we can get a planet with liquid water. It's not necessarily the Earth yet, but we do have a generic planet with water. Next, Victor will talk about the building blocks of life. Why is this water important and how does it factor into potentially the emergence of life itself? And finally, Dan will talk about the uniqueness of life as we know it. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention and I'll turn things over to Victor now. Awesome. Thank you, Garrett, very much for that introduction. Um, can you guys all see my slides? Yep. Awesome, I'm gonna go with it. So thank you very much. My name is Victor Oymos. I am a second year here at Yale. Don't let that flag behind me fool you. I've got a, you know, a Yale beanie, things too expensive to just buy for stock. I actually go here. Um, I'm a second year in the genetics department, and I'll be giving you a talk about the building blocks of life. So let's get started. Um, what we just heard from Garrett was how Earth was formed and how asteroids brought water to Earth. And I wanted to help you conceptualize this with a timeline that I made. And you can see that about four and a half billion years ago, Earth was formed. For about 500 million years or half a billion years, Asteroids were thought to have been falling on Earth and bringing water, um, water to Earth. 
and I put this timeline in perspective you, for, uh, to help you think about it. Dinosaurs came only 230 million years ago, and humans came about 2.4 million years ago. So this happened a very, very long time ago when water is being brought to Earth. What I want to talk to you about now is where did life come from? Where did life, how did life get here on Earth? How did it originate? What happened to get it here? So going back to this timeline, I put one more event on here, and that is when single cell organisms first happened. The first life happened about 4 billion years ago. And you can see that happens about right after water came to Earth. So you can kind of see already how important water is. But before I really delve into um, these organisms in life, we got to understand what is life made of. And life is really made of these four macromolecules called lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now, what is a lipid? Well, lipids are things like fat and oil. Um, and fat and oil, you need that for life. And some of you have been thinking like, oh, no, you know, I was always told fat's bad for you. But really, if you think about it, your cells, the outside of every cell in your body is made out of lipids. And fun fact, actually, in the age of COVID, the vaccine um, that we hear about the, the, um, is actually um, packaged in a lipid nano droplet. So that lipid fuses into your cell and gets the vaccine into you. So good thing for lipids, you know, that we have this vaccine and hopefully life can go back to normal soon. Um, another macromolecule is carbohydrates. And these are just carbs, things you hear about all the time. And these are simple sugars you get through bread and fruit um, and other things. And my favorite way to get carbs in the body, the potato. I love French fries. And so thank you, potato. Now there's two other uh, macromolecules on here I haven't talked about yet. And that's the protein and nucleic acids. Now, what are they? Well, to answer that, I'm going to uh, explain something called the central dogma. And what that is, it is not a cute little doggy, although I wish my talk was about this cute little corgi. What the central dogma really is, is the process in which DNA becomes RNA and then protein. And so I'm going to break this down for you and explain what these are. So what is DNA? DNA in its simplest form is the blueprints for the body. It's the instruction manual. It makes you, you. Everyone has DNA and all our DNA is very similar, but slightly different. And so slight differences that make everyone unique and special in this world. Now, the next step in the process is RNA. And what is RNA? Well, RNA simply can be the delivery mechanism in the body. It's a little delivery boy that gets the instructions from the DNA and delivers it, delivers it to a machine, a little factory in your body that makes the most important thing of this talk, protein. Now, what is protein? Well, a lot of you may be thinking right now, protein, you instantly think meat, right? Chicken, fish, beef, meat, dairy, all that stuff. Others might be thinking, yeah, big, strong muscles. And I need to work on my Photoshop skills a little bit here or just go to the gym. One of them needs to improve, probably Photoshop. But, you know, protein, right? We have big, strong muscles here. But that's protein in the nutritional sense, right? Or other, other ways of thinking about it. But what are proteins really? What are these little molecules, macromolecules? Well, to help you think about that, we're going to think about proteins like Legos. Now, each of these structures here that I'm showing you can be a protein. You can have a tiny little one with three blocks or a little, uh, little tower looking one or whatever you want. Each structure can be a protein and each one's unique, but you can see they share some blocks. Some structures have the same little red cube or long yellow one. And we can see that proteins are made out of blocks, these little Legos, these little subunits. And what these each little Legos are, these are gonna be called amino acids. And one way to help you remember that word is this fun little science joke I have for you. And it says, what do you call an acid with an attitude? And it's got a little amino acid here. Here's a little like, give me your lunch. And you would call this amino acid. So I hope this little science joke helps you remember that word for the rest of this little talk. Now, what are they? Well, there are 20 amino acids in the body, 20 essential amino acids that make up all the proteins in your body. And from this list, I want to show you one called glutamine because it's very important to me to my research here at Yale and to my family. And so I drew it for you. And I actually color coded each atom, each element for you in this molecule to show you that they're really simple. And they're made of four simple elements, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it, the order of these elements really makes each acid unique and different. 
Now, there are 20 amino acids, yet we can make thousands of proteins in the body. And you may wonder yourself, you know, okay, cool Legos, right? You put a few together, you make different Legos, but how can you make that many proteins with only 20 different little blocks? Well, let me help you think about it in another way. What about the alphabet? We only have 26 letters, yet we make hundreds and thousands of words in the English alphabet. And most words I know aren't longer than like 15 letters. And proteins are made out of hundreds or thousands of amino acids in a row. So you can imagine with hundreds or thousands of amino acids with 20 different ones at each one, how many different amino acids, I mean, proteins you can make in the body and how each one can be unique and different. So it's kind of, you know, bewildering how many they can make. Really cool. But how did they get here? Going back to that first question I gave, where did they come from? Where did life arise on earth? And to answer that question, we're actually going to go back in time a little bit to this period, this between four and a half billion to four billion years ago when water was coming to earth. So we're going to go back in time to this artistic rendition of what primordial earth could have looked like. And there's always two things that stand out to me in this picture. The first is the sheer amount of water in this image, this beautiful water. Now, the second is these volcanoes. And volcanoes, primordial earth, are very chaotic. And scientists think that these volcanoes were a source of a lot of gases into the atmosphere, spewing out these gases. But also they were a form of energy. Volcanoes are very hot. They're getting off a lot of heat. And that energy could have helped drive life on Earth in combination with these gases and water. So Earth's early atmosphere, back, uh, in, back in the 1950s, were hypothesized to be made of simple gases from these volcanoes, like methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. And I drew them out for you here. If you look at these that I drew out for you, and you think about that molecule I talked about earlier, you realize there's no oxygen, right? There's no oxygen in these molecules. So how can life, if you look at this molecule and all these oxygens it has in there, where did it come from? How can we have made life if there's no oxygen back then? Well, two scientists in 1952 named Miller and Ure looked and they used the resources that scientists at the time thought were abundant. They used these simple gases and they added one more key element in the reaction, water. And so water, as you can see here, has that oxygen. And possibly that could have been a source of uh, oxygen for life to form. And now there's one other key uh, element they used, and that was lightning. They thought maybe, you know, primordial earth is chaotic and lightning was striking the water and these gases and making life on earth. And so they tested it. And this is a diagram of their experiment where they put the simple gases in this glass tube and they shocked it with electricity, kind of like spark plugs in your car, and they let it go through and had a little beaker of boiling water and they let it run just for like a week or so. And you can see a little lamp on the bottom, possibly being a volcano, giving off heat to the primordial earth, and they let it happen. And then they analyzed it and said, what happened? And so the results of the experiment were pretty fascinating. They actually made five amino acids. Now these are the little Legos, you know, not the proteins yet, but just the Legos. But it's fascinating that they could make them from just simple gas. Some of these looked like glycine or were glycine. Others were alpha and beta alanine. And now very interesting, both of those molecules are alanine, but they're different because they're a mirror image of one another. You can take it and flip it. However, they're not a perfect mirror image. And on my computer screen, they may look like that, but in three-dimensional space, they're different. And that's actually what Dan's gonna talk about next. So spoiler alert for the next talk. Another fun fact, a thing you may be thinking about is that, Victor, that's cool and all. They made five amino acids, but you told me earlier they need 20 for life. So this can't be true. No way life came from lightning hitting water. Well, this was in 1952. In the past decade or so, later studies have actually redone these experiments with different gases and different combinations of what we think Earth looks like now. And so they produced about 17 out of 20 of the amino acids but they also made the molecules that make DNA. So if you remember from earlier talk, DNA is the instruction uh, manual that tells you know, the body to make proteins. So not only was primordial earth making the Legos, it was also making the booklet that comes with Legos saying what to make. So now you can make K, like order out of disorder now, which is really cool and really beautiful. Um, and so you know, just to wrap up this you know, very brief talk about life on earth, you know, we just saw from Garrett how water came to earth. And I'm telling, I just told you about how proteins are the building blocks of life, 
how proteins are made of amino acids. But the most important part of this talk really is how water allowed for these basic molecules to form and how without water, life may never have risen on Earth. Next up, we have Dan talking about how structure codes for life. And we're going to look at how these molecules, these mirror images of one another, are actually very unique and different. Thank you for listening to my talk. Hi, can everyone see my slides? Let's see. Uh, all right. So yeah, I'm the last talk. Uh, my name is Dan, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the final steps. Uh, you know, the, the way that uh, you went from having biological molecules, as Victor talked about, to actually having life. And I'm going to talk about some of the mysteries associated with the origin of life. So a quick recap before we continue. So Garrett has told us about how uh, water probably got to Earth from asteroids. Uh, and that's very important uh, for the formation of life. And Victor told us about how conditions naturally present on the early Earth could have actually formed biological molecules like amino acids and parts of DNA spontaneously, just using the environment that was there. And then, you know, the final step really to getting life is how do these biological molecules give rise to life? And I'm going to be talking about this question, but I'm really going to be talking about another question that's related to this question that really needs to be answered before this question can be answered. So let's go back and talk about something that seems completely different for a while. So you might realize that most objects and most molecules, in fact, have some sort of symmetry. So you could think about tables, chairs, beds, whatever. They all have some sort of symmetry. Uh, a water molecule, for example, has reflection symmetry, which means that, for example, you can take the side on the right and turn it into uh, the side on the left just by flipping it, and it looks the same. That's reflection symmetry. Uh, water molecules also have what's called rotational symmetry, which means that uh, for the, in the case of water, you can turn it 180 degrees around uh, in this way, and it will look the same as it did originally. That is called rotational symmetry. So this is, these are just two different kinds of symmetry. Now I have a related question for you. Take a look at your hands, hold them out in front of you and answer a simple question. Are your hands the same or are they different? So the answer is complicated because in some ways your hands are approximately the same. They look the same. They're mirror images of one another. But you can tell that they're not actually exactly the same because if you take your right hand and try to turn it around to make it look like your left hand, you actually can't because while you can align the fingers, the palm will then be facing the wrong way. So no matter what you do, you can't turn a right hand into a left hand and you can't turn a left hand into a right hand. So it turns out that these two hands that you have are uh, what are what's called non-superimposable mirror images. They are mirror images, but they're actually different from one another. And that's gonna be important later. Now take a look at this molecule here. It doesn't matter what the details are. All that it matters is that there's an atom in the center bound to four different things. Now take a look at this molecule. Now answer the simple question. Are these two molecules the same or are they different? Well, one way to find out, just as we did with hands, would be to turn the molecule on the right around and try to line up as many of the atoms as possible with the molecule on the left. So let's do that now. Okay, so we've lined up the purple sphere and the red sphere, but now we see that actually when we do that, the green sphere and the white sphere are switched compared to the original molecule on the left. So uh, this molecule is also an example of a molecule that has a non-superimposable mirror image. And uh, actually another way to say this is that this molecule has no symmetry whatsoever. This phenomenon is called molecular chirality and it comes from the Greek word hieri, which means hand. I realize that doesn't really sound like chirality, but 
the English pronunciation can sometimes really distort things. Uh, just a little bit of history. So uh, this phenomenon of non-superimposable mirror images in molecules was discovered by Louis Pasteur, who was a French scientist. He's most famous for uh, discovering germ theory or the idea that microbes cause disease, pretty important. But he also discovered chirality when he was actually observing the uh, solids left behind in a barrel of wine or a bottle of wine. Sometimes there are solids at the bottom. And he looked at those solids. And in those solids, he saw two different kinds of crystals, one that looked like the one on the left and one that looked like the one on the right. Now I'm going to ask you a question for the third time. Are these two crystals the same or are they different? Well. Actually, just as before, these two crystals are different from each other, even though they are mirror images. Because if you think about it, there is no way to take the crystal on the right and turn it into the crystal on the left just by turning it around in three-dimensional space. So uh, these kinds of crystals are formed from chiral molecules, or molecules that have handedness. And now with modern technology, we actually know the compound that made up uh, these crystals, and it looks like this on the molecular level. And it's actually called tartaric acid, and it's present in grapes, obviously, and a bunch of other fruits as well. Uh, it's also added to sour candy as one of the acids to make, uh, for example, sour Skittles. And this molecule has a non-superimposable mirror image. The left and the right molecules are not the same, even though they are mirror images. OK, so I've been talking a lot about symmetry. And this might be interesting, or it might not be interesting. But what does this have to do with the origin of life? Well, we'll get there. And to get there, we're going to talk about some history again. So let's go back to the 1950s. In the 1950s, uh, they discovered some drugs that would help with morning sickness in pregnant women. But then they noticed that at the same time, a lot of babies were born missing parts of their body, like their arms, their legs, or sometimes fingers or toes. And no one could figure out why. And they ended up tracing it to prescriptions of a molecule called thalidomide, which you may be familiar with. Um, so this molecule looks like the molecule on the right that I have showing here. But let's look at this molecule in a little bit more detail to see its connection to what we've been talking about already. So uh, this is the same molecule uh, in three-dimensional space, or I'm trying to show it in three-dimensional space. And it turns out that there is a left-hand version of it and a right-hand version of this molecule, just like left and right-hand hands. And it actually turns out that the one on the left actually does help with morning sickness as advertised. But the one on the right causes birth defects, such as, again, missing arms, legs, fingers, or other body parts. Now, how is this possible? Well, it turns out that when drugs are manufactured in a factory, most of the time, uh, in a roughly 50-50 mixture of the left and right-handed variety of the molecule is produced because it's much, much cheaper to make it that way than to separate the right-hand version from the left-hand version. And so in a pill or whatever form the drug was taken, there was a 50-50 mixture of the poison and the drug that actually worked. So now we're getting into the question, well, okay, this is interesting, but why can molecular handedness affect our health so much? What is it about our bodies, about our biology, that makes us susceptible to being affected differently by a left-handed version of a molecule versus a right-handed version of a molecule? Well, to find out that answer, we actually have to look deep, deep down on the molecular level. Um, into our cells. And in our cells, we have DNA. And in our cells, we have proteins. And DNA and proteins are both the kind of molecule that have the property of chirality. What that means is that they have left and right-handed forms. And it turns out that if you look at the DNA in our cells, we actually only have the right-handed form of it. And if you look at the proteins in our cells, it turns out we only have the left-handed form. And this is where it gets interesting because 
uh, once you understand that we have these particular forms and not a 50-50 mixture, you can understand how our body can react very differently to drugs depending on whether the drugs are left-handed or right-handed. And you can think of this as a handshake. So um, just a second. Uh, what am I looking for? Yeah, so you can think of it as um, uh, a handshake, right? So imagine that you are shaking hands with someone and it is a uh, right hand shaking a right hand. Uh, and imagine, or imagine that it's a left hand shaking a left hand. That works fine, but imagine your right hand shaking someone's left hand, right? Or the other way around. That doesn't really work so well. Or imagine uh, putting on a glove. Imagine that you are putting on a right-handed glove onto your right hand. So that would work very well. Uh, but imagine that you are now putting a left-handed glove on your right hand. So that wouldn't work. The only way you could really put it on is by pushing really hard and probably ripping the glove. And that's an analogy to what happens in the body when you take a drug that has the wrong handedness and that wrong handedness has some sort of toxic potential. So the, the sort of key takeaway here is that the molecules of life are also handed. And this is where this symmetry conversation that we've been having ties back to the origin of life. Because we can keep asking, well, okay, our molecules are handed, but why are they handed? How did they get that way? And, and it turns out that understanding this is really uh, the, similar to understanding the, or, the whole origin of life. So to understand why that is, we're gonna go back to the Miller-Urey experiment of 1952. So Victor talked about this, how they uh, took a bunch of molecules that were uh, you know, present on the early earth and they took lightning also present on the early earth and they took heat also present on the early earth and they mixed them together and they made a bunch of biomolecules like amino acids. But as Victor alluded to briefly, actually they made a 50-50 mixture of left-handed and right-handed varieties of all of these compounds. And uh, this is important because if you look inside our cells, as I said, the molecules have only one handedness and not the other. So this experiment is very impressive, but it doesn't really produce something that's similar to life because it was, if it was similar to life, it would produce only right-handed version of DNA and only left-handed versions of proteins, but it produced 50-50 mixtures. So there's something missing here. And if we understand this, we really will understand the origin of life much better. So to try to understand how one-handedness came to be dominant, I'm gonna ask you to assume one thing. Assume that um, one-handedness of DNA or of protein was slightly dominant at some point on the early earth during the origin of life. What could have made that small advantage turn into a complete advantage where 100% or almost 100% of DNA is right-handed and almost 100% of proteins are left-handed? How could that have happened? So was it a chemical process? Something involving maybe DNA replication? Well, we'll talk about that. Uh, or it could be a physical process involving no chemical reactions of any kind and simply things like melting and freezing. So we'll talk about that as well. So first about the chemical option. So uh, just to go over it briefly, the way that DNA replicates is the two strands of the double helix separate and each strand creates a template that allows smaller molecules to assemble into a matching strand uh, next to the original strand. So in this way, one molecule of DNA becomes two molecules of DNA. And you can think about this process like a handshake. When again, when, when a right hand shakes a right hand, it works. When a right hand shakes a left hand, it's awkward. The same thing happens with DNA. If the original molecule of DNA is right-handed, the template that it will provide for the new strands of DNA will be right-handed. And so the, the two DNA molecules that result will also be right-handed. So you can imagine that if there was a little bit more right-handed DNA in the beginning, that could turn into a major uh, difference in right-handed and left-handed DNA later down the line. And we'll talk about that. You can think of that as many, many handshakes involving right hands shaking with right hands or left hands shaking with left hands. 
And uh, the important process to understand here is exponential growth. So this is the kind of growth that DNA will have when it replicates. So DNA where uh, one strand goes to two, two goes to four, four goes to eight, eight goes to 16, and so on and so on, and it explodes. And when you have that kind of growth, even a slight difference in the initial uh, amount of right-handed versus left-handed DNA, or a slight difference um, in the replication abilities of right-handed and left-handed DNA, a, this small difference could arise by chance, but even a tiny small difference will lead to a very, very large difference in abundance uh, many generations down, as you can see from the blue curve overtaking the red curve after being actually quite close to it early on. So we've, we've established that uh, a chemical process could have generated some slight advantage for right-handed DNA, and that could have turned into a complete dominance of right-handed DNA. But we also have to consider something that isn't a uh, chemical at all, but a physical process. And the physical process we're gonna consider is repeated crystallization. So imagine that there's a pool of water containing some of the biomolecules that uh, Victor discussed <laughs> on the early earth. And in that pool, there are a bunch of crystals that are of, of molecules that are all mixed together. You have right-handed molecules and you have left-handed molecules. Now imagine that more water enters into that pool or the pool heats up due to a volcano, for example. Those compounds would be redissolved into the mixture. Then imagine that this water were to cool very slowly or to evaporate very slowly. When it happens slowly, it allows molecules to find their preferred partners rather than just ending up with whatever is closest uh, to them. And by this mechanism, right-handed molecules can find right-handed molecules and left-handed molecules can find left-handed molecules. And when they do that, they recrystallize as large pure crystals of only right-handed uh, molecules or only left-handed molecules. These molecules are a lot like uh, those crystals that Pasteur observed, uh, but, it, but you can imagine they were DNA or something like this instead of tartaric acid. Now imagine that uh, a wind blew and one of these crystals, the one on the, on the right, blew into another pool. And in that pool were more molecules that uh, were capable of turning into life. Whereas the other uh, crystal, the left-handed crystal of DNA blew away or was buried or some in some way disappeared from the scene. You can imagine how such a process could uh, actually mean that uh, the right-handed DNA uh, came to dominate and it was might've been purely by chance. But one interesting possibility that this could have uh, this brings up is that life evolved only once. Because if this happened once, it's easy to imagine. But it's hard to imagine how this process could have happened multiple times. And it's hard to imagine how the right-handed DNA would have won every time. You would think that it would be roughly 50-50. But it turns out that all the DNA is right-handed. So it may be that this process happened exactly once. So we've established that it could have been a chemical process. And it could have been a physical process that turned a slight dominance or even no dominance of the right-handed variety of DNA into a complete dominance. Uh, so just to go over this again, our DNA is right-handed and only right-handed. Our proteins are left-handed and only left-handed. And it turns out that even though understanding where this came from is a super important part of understanding the origin of life, we actually still don't know uh, why this actually happened, although we've discussed some possibilities. And a quick recap of all of our talks. So first we heard from Garrett who told us about how water came to the earth. Water is very important uh, for life because for example, it's a source of oxygen atoms. And it's also a source of salvation, a solvent for other things to dissolve in and react. And that's what Victor talked about, how the early earth plus water could have given rise to biological molecules uh, spontaneously. And now we've tried to connect the dots about how biological molecules uh, come go into life, but we've hit a bit of a snag because we don't understand why we have this dominance of one-handedness of DNA and one-handedness of protein. And if we don't understand that, we also don't understand the origin of life very well. And I'll have to disappoint you, but it turns out we actually don't know the answer to this and I don't have one for you. However, don't feel bad because mysteries are incredibly useful in science. In fact, mysteries are even more useful 
than knowledge because knowledge it's like okay you have it but mysteries make you think and when you think you ask other questions and then you get answers to questions that you asked and to questions that you didn't even ask. So what I would like to argue is that the mystery of where handedness came from um, is one of those useful mysteries that will guide scientific inquiry into the origin of life, hopefully towards amazing discoveries, some of which we actually expect and some of which are completely unexpected. Thank you. Great, uh, we have some time uh, to answer questions now uh, and I'll read them out from the chat. Uh, first, we have one for Garrett. How are the telescopes able to detect the dust in the solar disks that are forming if the light is obscured? What kind of telescope? Yeah, so this is a good question and it essentially boils down to the type of light that these telescopes are observing. So. I actually, if it's okay, I'd like to share my screen again. Um, so on this slide here, on the left-hand side, you can see the picture that I showed you before of that cloud of gas and dust that we uh, figured out collapses under its own weight and forms a star. Now on the right side of the screen, we see the same cloud, but imaged in a wavelength, a, a type of light that is emitted by warm things, not by sunlight. It's the infrared wavelengths. And the dust inside this cloud actually emits warmth, it emits infrared radiation, but it doesn't emit optical, it doesn't emit visual wavelengths, the Roy G. Biv of the rainbow. So on the right side, we can actually see that this infrared light, this heat can escape the cloud because we can see the stars, the warmth from the stars behind the cloud that were originally obscured by visual light. Now, the reason that we can see disks so well in the image that I showed you before is just because our telescopes got better angular resolution. That is, they could really zoom into the scales that you could see the heat from this, depth, from this dust. So it's a combination of looking at a different wavelength of light, a different type of light, and it's also a combination of just practically being able to zoom in a little bit more than we could before. Great, thank you. Uh, I have another uh, another question for Dan. Uh, could handedness theoretically develop in another star, uh, another star planetary system somewhere in the Milky Way or in another galaxy? Yeah, so uh, definitely could happen. Uh, of course, we don't know how rare origin of life is because we don't know what other life there is in the universe. But given the sheer number of stars and planets around those stars, it's likely that life may have actually evolved there too. And if it evolved, it's possible that it evolved similar molecules to the ones we use because of similar availability. And it's possible that those molecules had the opposite handedness. One of the things that I uh, like to imagine a lot uh, as a fun sort of idea is, you know, it would be cool to make life uh, exactly as it is here on earth, but with the everything, the opposite handedness. So basically with left-handed DNA and right-handed proteins, and it would work fine because everything is the other handedness. But imagine now taking this life and, and having it sort of confront regular life on earth. That might be, might be a very interesting, maybe apocalyptic sort of uh, thing to do, but it's fun to think about these things. Great, thank you. Uh, Victor. DNA is called the book of life, and Bill Gates has said DNA is a computer program far more complex than anything humans have ever written. Where could the language of DNA come from? Um, the language of DNA, wow. That's an interesting question. I mean, you're trying to write something with only four letters, and I guess just if you put enough, like put it enough times, something came out. Um, that's a great question. I don't know where the language of life, you know, arise. It's really more, you know, every three, every three uh, DNA bases codes for a different amino acid. Um, and yeah, I, I can't, I can't comprehend how many trial and error steps mother nature would have gone through to make it all work. Um, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not an evolutionary biologist that could even try to tackle that question. I'm sorry. No, I think that's a good answer. The time is, uh, is the big thing, the, the main ingredient. 
Uh, great. Uh, what formed the Big Bang and where were we before then? I think that's probably Garrett's yeah, area. Yeah, that's probably for me. Um, so this is a really good question. And I think the first thing that I want to differentiate is that the Big Bang took place around 13 and a half billion years ago. And the sun is actually only around four and a half billion years. So the sun is probably actually a second or even a third generation star. Um, now, the Big Bang was the beginning of the universe when all of the matter in the universe was condensed into a, a single point, essentially. Um, and before that, we really don't know. And we don't know if this is going to sound like a Cosmos documentary, but we don't even know if the concept of time existed before the Big Bang. Um, it's, it's one of those questions that we don't really have the tools to answer, and I'm not sure if we ever will, just because there's no observational evidence. Um, but that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I wish I could tell you more, and I think there are a lot of scientists that wish they could tell you more. Thanks. And uh, one more for anyone who wants to take it. What is the scientific definition of life? Is life whatever can replicate itself? Actually, not technically, I think, because like a virus can replicate, but it's not necessarily living in some definitions. Um, can I? Can I? Jump yeah, in you here? have to. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, go on, Dan. Dan, go for it. I think I think we're gonna have really interesting viewpoints from biologists and physicists on this one. Yeah. So I mean, generally, the idea is that life is something that uh, has information content within it. And it's able to replicate that information content uh, by itself without the use of something external. So as Victor talked about, um, <clears throat> viruses are not considered life, even though they have all of the biological molecules or many of the biological molecules that life contains because they need another organism, a cell, to do their replication for them. That's actually what they do when they infect a cell. So that's what makes them uh, you know, non-life. Uh, non What's interesting is that you can think about edge cases where you have a parasite uh, that is living, that came from a living cell that is so dependent on its host that it's already lost the ability to, for example, make, uh, you know, produce food or digest food or even replicate itself. Would such a, uh, a creature actually be considered living or not? It, it, what this really shows is that the definition is somewhat arbitrary and imperfect. I think another example of like, you know, what is life could be if you have robots that can make more robots. Are they living? They can move, they can replicate, they can do all the stuff, they have an energy source of, you know, electricity or whatnot, would they be considered living, you know? And then, you know, if they have AI strong enough, can they think, you know, will you consider them living? Um, life is an arbitrary term. We as scientists have given stuff and put stuff into bins, in my opinion, too. Um, so that's a hard question to answer fully directly, I think, as well. If you don't mind if I also jump in, I think that this is probably coming from a physics perspective as opposed to a biology perspective. But I, I think a good question is not necessarily trying to write down the definition of life, but asking what life does. Like what makes a living system, what makes things on earth that we would consider life different from something that isn't life? For example, you could consider replication as something like fire replicates. It grows and gets bigger and consumes energy, but it doesn't have the capacity to evolve. And alternatively, you can think of a computer as being a storage of information, but it can't, um, but it, it can't replicate itself, at least not yet. Um, I think defining life is going to be a really interesting problem. For a lot of people, especially as we start to turn our attention towards extrasolar planets, planets around other stars and trying to figure out the, some questions like whether we're alone in the universe, whether life exists on other planets and what form that might take. So yeah, I think you're asking a really interesting one of the big questions for the future. Great, thank you. Uh, another question for Garrett. You said that liquid water cannot exist in liquid form without an atmosphere. D 
Did the earth have an atmosphere as soon as it was formed or did it take time for an atmosphere to develop so the water coming in on meteors stayed as ice or vapor? Yeah, this is, um, this is also a really good question. And I think it depends on your definition of right when it formed. So in geological terms, we would say yes, right when it formed. But in terms of actual time, it was probably some number of millions of years. And that, that atmosphere would have built up over time and it probably wouldn't have resembled the one we have today. But the point is that within some number of millions of years, you would have had an atmosphere that would have been able to sustain water. So yeah, that's um, a good question. And I think it's still an active area of research today, trying to figure out what ancient Earth's atmosphere would have looked like and how it got here. Great, uh, and for Dan, how might handedness inform our efforts in drug development? That's a great question. Uh, so in general, after the thalidomide sort of uh, horrible situation, uh, you know, scientists are aware that uh, when there are drugs that have this property of handedness, uh, you have to make sure that both handednesses actually are okay. What happens a lot is that uh, one of the versions, like for example, the right hand version of the molecule, is simply ineffective or less effective and the left one is fully effective. And in that case, it's usually cheaper just to make a 50-50 mixture than to try to separate left and right. And in that case, it's fine. But of course, they still need to check that uh, both versions uh, you know, actually uh, don't hurt the person or don't hurt uh, something related to the person. So it's definitely, it was definitely, it's this thalidomide case is really a a case that showed how important handedness can be in drugs. Luckily, a lot of drugs are small molecules that actually don't have uh, two different forms, left and right. So that problem doesn't exist, but for some, some drugs, it still does. Thanks. Uh, one more question and please uh, feel free to retype this if I'm misinterpreting. Uh, is the chemical sulfur part of life? Yeah, um, sulfur definitely involved in amino acids. It's just a more complex molecule. And in the simple hypothesis I showed about those molecules, methane, ammonia, they only had carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen in that first theoretical model. Um, later studies then used gases like sulfur dioxide that a source of sulfur, sulfur and oxygen beyond water. And so some amino acids do have sulfur in them. Um, and so that was just, I simplified my talk a little bit. So sorry about that. But yes, sulfur is definitely important for life. Great. Well, thank you for your uh, great answers. And thank you all for having us and for your wonderful questions. Uh, we always enjoy hearing from you. Uh, great. Thank you so much.